the local history feature is brought to you by Gravity FM in association with Your Heritage, awarding funds from the National Lottery. See www.hlf.org.uk. I'm sitting with John Pinchbeck and we're going to go on a pub crawl now, all the way down London Road, John. That's right. We used to start, we used to have a pint in each. That's 15 pints because we never actually reached the 16th pub. We used to get to the almost the end and then turn around and go all the way back again up the hill to Tony's Calf to finish off. Starting off with the Spotted Cow, which was a Warwick and Richardson pub. The building's still there. Then we cross the road to the Manor's Arms, which is now Pizza Hut. Then the long walk, long thirsty walk down. Uh, uh, there was a pub there, by the way, the Joiner's Arms, but that was bombed during the war. We'd walk all the way down to the Barley Mow and linger in there a little while. Cross the road to the Reaper, then to the, to the Reindeer. From the Reindeer, you cross the road back again to the Nags Head, where all the postmen used to go from about two in the afternoon onwards. Then down the road to the Railway Tavern, which later became the Guildhall Tavern, which now, I think, is an empty bank branch. From there, we cross the road again to the Red Lion, my favourite pub, and it had a lot of cartoons in there by Jack Cox of all local sportsmen. From the Red Lion, we cross the road to the White Hart, the White Hart, you'll all be pleased to know, was pulled down in the 90s to make way for Grantham's first McDonald restaurant. That, that was a sin. The last landlord I remember in there was a Mr Shakespeare. And you could quote him any time you wanted. Go down the road a bit and we come to the George Hotel. That's where it was posh in the Regency Bar. And the drinks were a bit overpriced. Then cross the road again, we've got the Angel and Royal. It was the Angel, of course, till about 1860-something when the Prince of Wales stayed there. He didn't like it being called Bertie's, not then. So he, he insisted it was called And Royal. From there, we cross the road to the Black Dog, which, of course, is still there. In those days, you went in there for a fight. Several times, we'd have to have a second pint in there because we'd get into that room where the, which you access through the bar into the other room and unfortunately there'd be a fight in the bar and you couldn't get out again and uh, next door used to be the blue dog but not in my time I have to admit and two doors further on just before Whipple's garage which is now quick fit is set back just before it's set back used to be the swan and salmon in the um, Victorian times, that was the rowdiest pub in Grantham, very much so. Lots of singing, das dancing, prostitution, etc. We actually could nip across the road then to the Bricklayers, which was about where the motor shop, motorbike shop is now. And then to the Joiners Arms, which is now the Nobody Inn. Joiners in the latter days was run by Mick Williams, who later became mayor. It was a great pub then, especially if you like darts. And then we'd terminate at the Blue Bull. Mainly, no, sorry, not the Blue Bull, the Blue Bell. We'd terminate at the Blue Bell. Now, we'd only terminate there because we suddenly realised it was 10 o'clock. And that was drinking up time then. You... Couldn't be served after 10 o'clock. You had 10 minutes to sup up, and then it was good night. So we never quite made it the up North Parade to the Oddfellas Arms, which used to sell the strongest beer in town anyway, so it probably just as well. Anyway, from the Blue Bell, we would then turn round, retrace the steps, all the way up Spittlegood Hill to the top, where we'd spend the rest of the evening in Tony's Calf. We do have lots of quite interesting pubs in Grantham, John. What about one or two other quirky ones? Barcode, which was at one time called the Market Cross, the establishment, etc., had from 1830 held the title of Frederick Fletcher Limited, known as either Fletcher's or its nickname, the Fur and Feathers, after the ladies who in Edwardian times used to use the snug there. The King's Arms, a lot of people will still remember as the Blue Ram, 
But before it was the blue ram, when Mr. Manners changed it all, it was, would you believe, the King's Arms. And it was certainly a venue for cockfighting in the 1790s. One little oddity was, and I couldn't tell you when this law was rescinded, but certainly in Victorian times, it was illegal for a woman to sit in a bar, in the bar of a pub, that is, without being accompanied by a gentleman. Could she, she was stand? not. She could stand, but she wasn't allowed to sit. Um, and the landlord could be fined 50 shillings. But when you think that at that time the average wage was about £4 a week, it was a lot of money for allowing a woman to sit in, in a bar. One of the questions people used to ask a lot was why we had so many blue pubs in Grantham. Now, granted, there aren't many blue pubs left, but at one time there was 14 blue pubs, and it all came about by Sir William Manners. Now, he wasn't a particularly nice bloke. In fact, he was rather mardy, because he bought the manor of Grantham and stood for Parliament in 1796, but was beaten by Simon York and George Sutton. So in a fit of pique, he decided Grantham must be taught a lesson. So he took down the market cross, as his father and Father John had tried to do a couple of decades earlier. He also threatened to plough up the marketplace and took away the pipe supply and the conduit, or condif, as a lot of people still call it here. But his best remembered action was to quickly buy up 14 inns and change their name to incorporate blue which provided free drinks to those declaring themselves for the Whigs, which was Sir William's party. Only the Blue Pig and the Blue Bull remain. But altogether, as I say, there was 14, including the Blue Bell on North Street, the Blue Boat up Old Wharf Road, the George and Blue Bull on High Street, yep, that was its original name, the Blue Cow in Castlegate, the Blue Dog next door to the Black Dog, the Blue Harbour on Bridge End Road. By Bridge End Road, we do mean uh, the out of town part of Bridge End Road. The Blue Horse on London Road, which is now a chip shop. The Blue Horse in Westgate. The Blue Lion in the Marketplace, which is now Limpet's, Limpet House. The Blue Man in Westgate, now derelict, it's had a few names since so. The Blue Pig in Vine Street, which is still there, thankfully. The Blue Ram in Westgate, which is now the King's Arms. And the Blue Sheep in Marketplace, which was knocked down to widen the road into Union Street. Samuel Mowbray began brewing in Westbourne Place, off Dysart Road, in 1828. And then he moved to a site up to Brewery Hill. In 1842, he expanded to London Road, Rycross Street and Commercial Road. So he was at the back, and on London Road, you'd got redheads. And then they took over redheads. So it was a big complex altogether, crossing three streets. So beer was very important to the town? Beer was essential to the town. It was essential to any town. Tea would cost you something like five pounds for a quarter of a pound. It was a real rich man's drink. You couldn't drink tea. You couldn't drink the water. I mean, half the water was being polluted by uh, the sewage. So the only drink was beer. It was the only thing safe to drink. That's why there were so many pubs. At one time, there was 140-odd pubs in Grantham. If we take the Norton Street area alone, we have the Odd House, which originally was the Spread Eagle, that has now closed, of course. The Three Tons in Norton Street, which closed in '58. The Victoria Hotel in Commercial Road. The Junction. The Leighton Arms. The Norton Arms in Norton Street, of course. The Railway Inn in Queen Street, which used to be known as the League of Nations. The Dolphin on Commercial Road, the, that was more like a front room than, uh, uh, than a real pub. And yet it was one of the most popular pubs in town in a funny sort of way. Everybody liked the Dolphin. Everybody remembers the Dolphin, especially when Henry Rivers kept it. Henry, of course, then moved down to the Blue Horse which was then next to the football ground and is now a fish and chip shop. The Brewer's Arms in Brewery Hill, that was built in 1830 and that was one of Redhead's Brewery. And the Victoria Tavern in Rycross Street, 
A small Victorian beer house which closed in 1955, but I don't remember it in truth. You mentioned 1958 there. Mm. A lot of pubs closed in 1958. They did. I haven't got a full answer for that, but it certainly was a time when pubs closed down, fashions changed probably. We didn't need that many pubs all at once. It clashes with people getting televisions in the home, for instance. When a brewery wanted to uh, build a new pub, they used to have to cash in two licences. There was one on Dysart Road, which actually was never built. It was a sign up there and they cashed in the two old licences for it. But it, it was never actually built. Not until Coles Cranes built it as a social club. And then it, it was sold off as a pub. And then became uh, the sportsman. But that's no more. I mean, when you think about it, you couldn't imagine, in, even in the 50s, an area as big as Harrowby losing the cherry tree or the Rose Castle on Earlsfield actually closing for a bit. And look now on Harlixton Road, the Isaac Newton's been pulled down, the Hunting Tower is now offices. I mean, you've only got the Springfield left in that area. We've mentioned this one, the Blue Bell. The that Blue Bell. The Blue Bell, of course, used to be in North Street in Little Gunnerby rather than Grantham. And in those days, when there was an inquest, there was inquests were always held at the Blue Bell. They had, in those days as well, they always had the body at the inquest laid <laughs> out in a table. <laughs> On the, so, in the so the jury could inspect it. And the Blue Bell, incidentally, began life as a farmhouse. It's now part of Asda's car park. Now, this one I've got down closing in 1927. Yeah. Forrester's Arms. Yeah, the building's still there. And it is opposite the Conservative Club in Castlegate. It's just, an, it's just a normal terraced house now. You'd have to look closely and you'll just see those markings there. Oh, that's the Blue Ram Yard. Oh, yes. Yeah, that used to be the studio for the Photographic Club studio and that one was the dark room and it's all Rented little it. shops and things now it's all it? shop well in truth it was all knocked down i think and rebuilt and this says it's oh the yes sun inn. the sun inn yeah that was in brownlow street on the corner of broad street that was knocked down and i can't say it was knocked down for premier court but premier court stands here now it closed in 1958 yeah it's a long time before premier court yeah but that, that land was empty for it a was. long long time it stood empty a long time yeah. didn't it, with boards all around it yeah and, 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 and with just middle. those shops well bone sweet shop and another yeah. one about three of them for years decades i don't know how old that one is that's the ancient now, royal with a horse yes now just there was that was across swords now now, this became what was known as Noor's Ark, a haberdashery, and it had a little Noor's Ark on the top. It's Bertie's Bistro now. Westgate, closed in 1960, the old malt shovel. I don't remember it being as attractive as that. No, it's funny, and if you go to the Grantham Matters Co. UK website, you'll see that the malt shovels far from being just converted, has the archway in a different place. So if you look at a picture of the old malt shovel and what is now converted into Hop Sing's Chinese restaurant, the archway's moved. It's, it's, in fact, it was not converted, but it was rebuilt. That's the Royal Oak in Stewart Street. That was very similar to the Dolphin. The Royal Oak in Stewart Street was another of those where the bar was up against the wall and the landlord was the same side as you were. I've never been in a pub like that. <laughs> uh, they're quite fun. The Rose and Crown to Swinegate. The Rose and Crown was actually next door to the Blue Pig. And it, it's older than the Blue Pig. The Blue Pig originated as a little row of cottages. And in the 1920s, it did very, very well to survive. Crown and Anchor. 36 Swinegate. Yes, that was for many years used for by RM Wrights as their parts store. It was pulled down and it is now the nursing home. It's on the corner of Church Street. When they pulled it down, they found a very old medieval well. Just going back to the Blue Pig, Blue Pig landlord James Broughton was fined £2 with 11 and 8 pence costs in 1883, despite his denials of running a house of ill repute. He pleaded not guilty of knowingly permitting his pub to be the habitual resort or place of meetings of people of bad character. Sergeant Gray said over a two-hour period he saw several women of bad character go into the Vine Street pub. 
He said he saw 13 bad women enter and stay a considerable time. He must have been there all night. <laughs> <laughs> no, he certainly seems to have enjoyed himself. I find that very difficult to believe. There are no people of bad character in Grantham. <laughs> it's strange, actually, because um, there's no evidence that the Blue Pig before 1826, was a pub, and it is believed it was just a range of cottages. It is one of the few Tudor buildings that survived Grantham's major fires, and it's now classed as one of our, well, it's one of our gems, isn't it? And yet, it wasn't until 1925, when they were going to improve it, that they discovered it was a half-timbered building on the outside. It had all been stuccoed over. I don't know what we're looking at um, here yeah, it's the um, Seven Stars, Manthorpe Road. The garage is about there, right. the filling station. There, there was two very old pubs along there. Now, one of them was there in, in Cobble today. Well, he didn't drink, did he? No, but his men did. <laughs> some, some of them got so drunk, they came out of the pub and ended up in the wrong army. Grantham was um, a garrison for Cromwell. The f he won his first battle at Grantham when he was stationed there. The Battle of Gunnaby Moor, that, that is the first victory of the New Model Army. It's not usually counted because there was the New Model Army coming along and six cavaliers from Newark on a recce. And the, it was a skirmish. It was known as the Battle of Gunnaby Moor, I think, did, with a bit did of Cromwell tongue in spend cheek. a lot of time around yeah, there Yeah, he, he lived at Gunnaby. Is it Green Street, the one where the t two chapels used to face each other? If we were roundheads, yeah. parliamentarians, did you call us? Is that the proper word? Y yeah. Newark was royalist. Oh, yes. Nottingham was uh, Cromwell, though. Beaver and Staunton in the Vale both had armies for royalists. So it's a pretty volatile area, it this was. a volatile was. area. Uh, and yet they seem to get on quite well together. Well, they were working the pub, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's nice of you to see me, Linda. <laughs> I'm talking to Linda Graves, and I'm sure you all remember Linda, because she used to have her own radio show. I'm looking at the old pubs of Grantham, and your mum and dad were very much involved. They were, yes, yes. In the old days, I'm going back to sort of wartime now. They retired in 74, so that's quite a way ago now. So your mum and dad, Florence and Horace Fish, they were married by a special licence? They were indeed, yes. Dad was working at the Red Line on High Street, Grantham. He was a bar seller man and mum was working opposite at the George Hotel. She was a chambermaid and the opportunity came up for dad to take over the tenancy of the Blue Harbour Inn at Cold Harbour, which is right on the eastern edge of town if you know anything about it. Not there anymore, but the house is still there. But it was only open to a married couple. So a rather unromantic marriage proposal of how about it was followed by, well, might as well. And so they took up the tenancy of the Blue Harbour. And obviously your father was very experienced at most of the things that were necessary. Well, yes, he had been working there for quite a while at the Red Lion, yes. And your mum would know all about the trade as well. Exactly. So yes. It was a perfect choice for them. It was really, yes. It was tailor-made, I think. So what sort of clientele did you have at the Blue Harbour? Well, it was mostly locals from the surrounding farms and villages. Passing trade going to the coast, obviously. And, of course, loads of airmen. I remember the airmen. Even I'm though, sure you Even do. though I'm talking of <laughs> years after the war. Um, from RAF Spitalgate, which is now, of course, William of Gloucester Barracks. And later on in the war, the American airman was stationed, I believe, at Barkston Heath Aerodrome, and they came in as well. So you, you relied quite heavily on the military? I think it's true to say, yes. But this is, this is the Second World War, is it? This it is, is yes, on? yes. Of course, the, the Spitalgate carried on for quite a long while after the war. Have you got any other family? I have. I've got a sister who's a little bit older than me and a brother who's considerably older than me. But we were all born there. And we all have very happy memories of the place. It was quite an old building and it was said to be frequented by the famous highwayman Dick Turpin. And I don't think, to be honest, it had been improved very much in the ensuing years. There was no electricity, no gas and only well water, and that was courtesy of the farmer over the road. So it was quite primitive, but cosy. Yeah, we had paraffin lighting, you know, coal fires. It, it was nice. What about toilet facilities and, and bathing and things? How did that all work? Oh, well, we had a tin bath in front of the kitchen range on a Sunday evening. The toilet facilities were very basic. They were the sort of bucket and chuck it type, although we did get quite modern. 
towards the end and we had an L fan, a chemical toilet, and we're very posh with that. Have you got any other memories of being at the pub at that time? Well, we had a Yorkshire Terrier at the time by the name of Tess, and Tess got into many scrapes. I remember she came home peppered with shot once when a farmer took a gun to her and Dad had to pick all the pellets out with a, a little blade, but she was very good. There was a memorable time when she fell down the well and she had to be rescued by ropes and ladders. And then we found her trying to struggle out of the old fan at one time. No, oh, she was investigating it. She toilet, was she? investigating it, yes. And we came to the conclusion she was probably a deep sea diver in a previous life. Can you remember any stories about some of your regulars? I can remember, yes. I try not to use any names, but there was one lady we used to call Auntie Pem. Now, why Pem, I don't know, because I had no idea what her name was. And I can remember her, she had bright red lipstick. That was the thing that I can remember most of all. And she and her, as I assumed, husband, used to come quite regularly. And then one day they were in the bar and somebody said, who's that strange woman with him? And somebody said, shush, that's his wife. And it was another lady. (laughs) So you said you had access to well water from the farmer. That's right, yes. But at one time, for whatever reason, I can't remember now, we didn't have the access to the well water, obviously, to dried up or whatever. And so the brewery kept us supplied with drinking water, fresh water, in used beer barrels. But they used to drop it off for you? Yes, they did, with, with the beer delivery. And we used it for drinking and cooking and laundry and bathing. In fact, everything you would use water for. But eventually, we all became quite ill. And we didn't know what it was until the doctor arrived. And he diagnosed that we were all suffering from alcoholic poisoning <laughs> because the alcohol from the beer barrels was leaching into the water. So you were drinking contaminated water, really? We were, yeah. When did you get mains water? Can you remember? We never did get Wayne's water, no. No, it was always the, the well water until we left. But we left there in 1958, so I presume they've got mains water now, but I don't the, know. The pub's not still there, is it? The pub isn't, no, but the house is. It was converted into a, an ordinary house yes so it's that's still there and and the farmer oh the farmer he was how can we put it tight i suppose would be <laughs> one word frugal would be another but he kept the usual sort of farm animals um i can remember feeding the baby lambs when they were abandoned and orphaned and i can still feel the, the woolly coat of them now you know and we used to feed them with bottles and so so on um he kept hens and ducks And these hens, and especially the ducks, used to wander across the road to us. And, of course, they would lay their eggs wherever. And Dad thought this was wonderful, because he got free eggs, and he was all out for no, was my dad. And, of course, my farmer, he was most upset, because he was, as I say, very frugal. One day, when we were having a beer delivery, one of the barrels burst, and the ducks all made a beeline for the newly formed pond, and great hilarity followed. Because after dabbling and splashing in the spilt beer for some time, they began to behave in a most peculiar way until someone realised that they were completely blotto. It's a drunken duck. Drunken ducks, yes. (laughs) I mean, when you see one lying on its back with its little feet in the air, you know, you know there's something wrong, don't you? You were very young, Willis. I was, yes. But was there any drunkenness? Was there any rowdy behaviour? There was drunkenness, yes, but it was quite well behaved. You know, people, when they got to the stage where they weren't capable, they were just turned out and they were quite happy at it. There was no fighting and saying, oh, I want more or anything like that. So if the landlord said you leave, you just left? You left, yeah. Were there ladies in the pub at this time? Yes, there were, yeah. Did you have a snug? Uh, No, we had two bars. One was the main bar where the bar itself was. And then we had what we called the piano room, because that's where the piano was, obviously, and we used to go and have sing-songs. So that was the entertainment? That was the entertainment, Live yes. music? Of course, It's yes. making a big comeback in pubs <laughs> locally. <yeah. laughs> what about drinks? What was the most popular tipple at the time? It would be beer, definitely beer and bitter. It was at Mowbray's Brewery. And they did Flowers Beer. Do you remember it? That was a trade name, Flowers Beer. Yeah, and it would be bitter and mild and pale ale. What did the ladies drink? Gin and lime, gin and orange, which I think is absolutely awful, but that, that was the height of things in those days. Yes. fashion. Yes. So there'd be no food at this time? Did you, did you put any food on it? No, no, we didn't really. Actually, during the war, I mean, as I say, I was born quite a while after the yes. war. Yes, oh yes, so I can see know, that. During the war, Dad used to make the odd penny by buying 
buying loaves of bread and just filling sandwiches with whatever he could get his hands on, really. And then he would sell those. Sell them for a few pennies, but every penny counts. Well, the Lord Nelson, as we moved to, we moved there in 1958, and as I say, Mum and Dad retired in 74. So they were there for getting on for 16 years or 17 years or Where was that one, the Lord Nelson? That was at the bottom of Gunnaby Hill. So it was Gunnaby Hill Foot, right on the corner of where Orchard Coast is now, opposite the little school. Well, we could really do with a pub there now. I think so, yes. I mean, a, unless under you shop go to too. the... Oh, an undershop. Yes. Maybe a pub's slightly more important. <laughs> We've got a pub in Great Gunnaby Village. Yes. And then you've got to walk all the way to the King's Hotel. That's right. Yes, it's quite a stretch, street. There's nothing it? in between, no. is there? Yes, the King's Hotel was always there. But, of course, it was a Diana Hotel in those days. So what do you remember about the Gunnaby Hill Foot Pub, then? Was that a house? No, it was always a pub. Made as a pub. And purpose it, built. Yes. Built. And then, of course, when we, Mum and Dad, retired from there it was uh, raised to the ground it's now Vaculux car park we lived there obviously you know we lived above and behind the the pub yes it was a a really nice coaching inn I would think it was because there were the big double gates where the coaching horses would have gone in there were stables there we used to call those the swallow house because the swallows used to go in in the summer and build and we had a pigsty in the garden and I can remember it had got a, a lovely brick built wall all the way round it and a proper little house where the pig used to have been I mean we never had pigs but it was an ideal playhouse for me when I was growing up it was like you know a place to put all my dollies and everything you know it was wonderful how did living in the place where your parents worked how did mm-hmm. that impact on your family life because it's a, it's a very time consuming trade very hard work yes long hours the hours are even more longer now because, I mean, they're open 24 hours a day almost, aren't they now? But as far as I can remember, it used to be half past ten in the morning until three in the afternoon. And then there was a break until six o'clock when they started again, through until about half past ten at night. Mum and Dad were always there. In fact, Mum said to me one day, she says, I felt quite guilty when I was bringing you lot up. She says, because I didn't bring you up, did I? She says, you had to do it yourself. And that was true, you know, we had to look after ourselves, really. When did you start drinking yourself? I mean, was that another oh, thing that was... what a thing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> the legal age was, I think, it always been 18, hasn't it? Not always, no, it was 21, and then the age of consent was brought down to 18. In fact, that was just before I got married, because I was married very early at 18. 18 and one month, actually, because Mum and Dad no way would have given their consent for me to marry. But they changed the law. They changed the law, so they didn't have any... <laughs> so you told them? I told them, <laughs> definitely, yes. So you were allowed to drink at your own wedding? Oh, yes. When we moved from the Blue Harbour, uh, Mum and Dad were offered the Blue Horse, which was um, on London Road, no longer there. But uh, Mum said, no, I don't want to work in town, not in town. Definitely not. So we moved to... So both of there. your pubs were quite country. Yes, on the edge of town, town, yes. On the edge of mm. town. And you didn't have any problem getting locals and customers? No. Despite being no. outside Because, of, of course, when we moved to Gunnaby Hill Foot, it was still the A1 in those days. Because the A1 went straight through town. You didn't get Dick Turp in there, then? Not at that time. <laughs> you might have had a highway. <laughs> not really realised. We might have done, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for talking that's to me. That's quite all right. Thank you for talking to me. I'm Ella from Gravity FM and I am talking to... Helen. And Paul. Helen and Paul. And you're from the... The Railway Club, Grantham Railway Sports and Social Club. How long have you been doing this? Well, I've worked, actually worked down here for about 15 years, but not us on the bar. It's changed a lot in 15 years. Yes, it definitely has. Yeah, we've, we've been running the bar side of it for about four or five years now. Yeah, about five years getting on. Since we've steward left, we've been running it between us. I'm trying to find out what sort of things have changed. I don't think we get so many at weekends as like we used to. Our oh, regulars, a lot of old ones have passed, passed away. away and and right. So it's trying not to get the younger generation. So when was this railway club established? 1955. And was it just for railway people at that time? It though? was at one time, yes. This was a canteen when it first opened. But they didn't have a bar or anything and then? No. Yeah. Oh, did they have a bar in the canteen? I, I don't know. I think they had a bar, a small That's bar. Yeah. And this when they converted it into a club. A club. But yeah. it would be exclusively for railway. It was for railway yeah. people. And their families, yes. presumably. Yeah. yeah. So what sort of things would they have done in those days? Played cards, dominoes. Did they have outings and things like that? I think they used to go yeah, down the coast. I and think they used yeah. to. Yeah. 
Is there anything specific that's changed in that 15 year period? You haven't got so many older regulars. No, we've still got uh, one or two got one members that still come in. Still what, are there still them. very strong links with the railway? No. There's not so many no, members not now. now. No, Some no. still work on the railway, but not many. So where do you find your membership now then? It's, uh, it's, anyone can be a member now. So it's local? It's Lo local, yeah. yes. Anybody yeah. can make sell the member. Right. What sort of events do you have? A lot of darts teams. I can see we've got a dance yes. team over there. Dominoes, cribbage. We have lots of functions, weddings, parties. And in the back room, you you hire that out. We do, yeah. yes. For example, you've got a beekeeping course going on yes. in there. We you? have, yes, for yeah. ten weeks. Have you had anything else unusual in that back room? All sorts of different functions, haven't we? Yeah, we've oh. had we've had a rabbit. We've show had there. race nights and rabbit, rabbit show. show and What's a rabbit show? Well, well, real rabbit. Yeah, real yeah. rabbits. Funny rabbits. Yeah, funny rabbits. Yeah. Yes. The rabbit, the and then rabbit. we also got the bird society, bird shows, budgies, and. Who what? clears up after that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's an interesting <laughs> job. Paul, how many members have you got here? Well, I know. For a fact, we've had over 400 join already this year. We're normally somewhere around about 450 to 500 a year. That's, that's quite a large membership. What are you going to do if they all turn up on the same night? Panic. Struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it would make the bar interesting. It would. Yeah. We have the buffaloes in twice a week. He'll do the work for charity. We have men cap. We, we have leisure support in once a fortnight or every once every four weeks. Come and see me on a Wednesday. They're actually in this week playing bingo right. and they play darts and do quiz nights. And that's men cap. That's yeah. Le yeah, yeah, leisure, leisure support. support. So They're it's like leisure. supported activities. It is, yeah. yes. So who, like who helps? Uh, they are volunteer members who bring them. Now you mentioned the buffaloes. The RAOB, is it? Is that a charitable? Well, they concern? do work for charity. Yes, they do a lot of work for charity. And Has the gender split changed at all? Are you getting more women now than you used to? <laughs> yes, we do get a lot of. We have, we have a lot of ladies' darts teams as well. There's an old photo here, but I wouldn't know any of the members on it. I would think that would be going back late fifties. And there are ladies there yeah. with a tipple in their hands. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, most of the ladies now don't have one of them glasses, they have a pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing that's changed. The measures have got bigger for the ladies. It has, yeah. yes. What, what are the trains? Obviously something to do with the heritage uh, of the town. Yeah, a lot of them are... Th one's, an old, one's a print of an old... What the class is, as a class A re-watering and coaling up in Grantham Station years ago. And then of course we've got the old, the big ones all around the room. The yeah, fine Scotsman and... Well, you get people keep coming down just to have a look at your photographs. They're coming for the history? Yes. If you had to sell a membership, what would you say are your best points? Good beer. What sort of beer is it? Oh, uh, we've got a real what? ale. We've done about, what, three or four hundred in the last... Is that like three a, guest, a guest A guest ale, ale yeah. yes. Right. Why would you suggest that they came and joined the railway club? Friendly bar staff. Friendly bar staff. That's <laughs> very important. We have got parking and we've got overflow car park. And it's a family club and children are welcome. It's easy access for disabled. And what about entertainment? We you have, have regular entertainment. Every, 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 sa Saturday. every Saturday night. What sort of things do you have on? We have a singer on, an singer artist on. on. We had a local lady on last week, Yvonne Rivers. Yvonne Yates, if people know her. She's brilliant. Grantham Bourne. So we do try and get local, Some local ones talent. if we can. Have you ever done a Grantham's Got Talent? No, we haven't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now there's an idea. Oh, talent by Gravity FM. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be Simon Cowell. <laughs> Give me the buzzer. It's <laughs> Friday night we have the bingo. Would you always get your, your same ones come for your bingo? And on a Sunday, Sunday night's a good night because we have a laugh, a joke. Have you got any funny stories? Well. You've flooded the cellar a few times, but it's not really funny. It is when you have to clean it up. <laughs> it's funny afterwards. <laughs> it is. I forgot to turn my tap off. <laughs> is that beer all over? No, place? water. Oh, water. Oh, that's yeah. all right. Yeah, as long as you don't waste the beer. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. You're welcome. I'm talking to Alan Senior. You've got these amazing files in front of you. In fact, I've just noticed this one is called Grantham Bygone Public Houses, Volume 1. Yep, that's it, and Volume 2 as well, dears. Now, what made you put these together? I don't know what really started me doing it. Because I started over 30 years ago now. I was chairman of Grantham Camera. 
And so I, th I thought I'd do a database, but I was interested in the pools besides doing a database. So I suppose it's two or three different things made me start. Cameras, the real ale? Yeah, the campaign for real ale. And they used to go in the Dolphin and the Victoria, because they used to do all commercial road. Of course, all them pools started vanishing, so I thought, time I started doing some sort of list or photographs of them all before they all vanished. So were you old enough to go into places like that? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. <laughs> but you did go in. <laughs> I did go in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I used to do a lot of errands. I used to win the old fox with my grand. Because you'd go in at ten and you know, give you a bottle of beer then. There was... The old fox was an off-licence, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah, a very yeah. early off-licence. Yeah, it was. Just off-sales. That's all they had. But they did, a, at the bottom of the passage, they had a little conservatory with um, tables. And I think I can remember seeing one or two people sat there. But I think they only had, they had an off sales. So through an arch, used to knock on the door, and she used to open their window or side the window. That's and Oxford used, Street, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and used to have them, uh, used to sell sweets and things like that, so I suppose that's, that's why I went. That was for the dads to keep the children quiet while yeah, they were. Yeah. Well, I can never remember anybody in there, hardly, when I ever went. What's there now? It's still exactly the same position as it is, I don't know, it's, it's just turned it into an house. Did you go in the Dolphin? I did, yes, because I lived a few doors away from the Dolphin. And the uncle used to go in there quite a lot, so every time I went down to the Dolphin, he always used to buy me a bottle of bulb. so that's why I used to go in and show me face, and you just used to get served there from an arch, so I always got three bottle of ponds, crisps, but I went to the Dolphin. Was it always very busy? Yeah, yeah, it's like a terraced house, so you went down the passage between two terraced houses, you turned right, and you got served from a little arch there, and a lot of people used to sit behind the bar, because they wanted a bar like this as such, so it was just a room. So it's just like a window been taken out and you got served through this hole. But you could go around through the door and sit at the back. Well, there was a lot more pubs in Grantham then. Yeah, oh, there was a lot more, yeah. yeah, yeah. They must have been quite important to the, to the locals. Yeah, so I suppose it was. But there was such a thing as supermarket centre. I suppose people buy wine now and lager, don't they? I can remember somebody here who lived in Commercial Road not far away. This old lady she used to get a tray with a towel over it. We used to go to the Dolphin and get a jug full of beer and take it home again. I don't know what the difference is between beer, ale, porter and all these words. Well, there's not much, is there, really? I mean, ale's just, I suppose, historically, it was in an unhopped beer, you know, perhaps from three or four hundred years ago, before hops came into England. And so then, you know, started putting hops in it, and I suppose that it was called bitter or mild, with less hops than mild. Porter was just a dark beer. Since I came 18, I went in nearly every pub that hour, you know, I went in a few before. Well, you have to, don't you? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. So and what's the this arms, one? She's now Pizza Hut. This is photographed from during the war years, when bombs had dropped on Ornsby, or the roof. And this is one just before it closed down. Everard's, Everard's brought it from Whitbread. And that's the same pub? Or does yeah, it look different? It does, yeah. It's still got that piece on the front. These look like Home Guard. That's Guard in it, won't they? Yeah, on a push bike. Yeah, on a push bike, yeah. I'm looking at a picture of the Dolphin now. It was the last building left when they knocked the commercial road down. The houses from the top and bottom was demolished and the was left standing for so long. So I used to live a few doors up here. So I used to go down the passage, turn right, and then used to get served in that room. And there was another room at the back here, up three or four steps I used to go. So this is like a two up, two down? Yeah, it's just a terraced pub. You wouldn't think there'd be enough room for a pub in there, would you? No, well, there wasn't. When you got served at the arch, you used to go around the back and there was about three or four chairs like this and you sit on them with no tables as such. There's a separate bar where you used to put these two or three steps to. So a dozen people and the uh, pub was packed? It'd be, yeah, absolutely packed. And this is the blue bell. should never have been knocked down. should never have been knocked down? No, they say not, because it's supposed to be one of the oldest buildings around that area. They reckon it was a farmhouse years ago. Was it listed? I'm not sure if it was listed. And they wasn't supposed to knock it down, and the bill went in on a Sunday and demolished the lot in one day. This is Wharf Road. I've put that because of this pub, the Hand and Heart, used to stand here. The Hand and Heart? Yeah. And it, I can't remember it because it closed down in um, 1957, so I was only five. But Jim Baxter brought it, and it was his Vic Jim Baxter's Victorian Bazaar. Mm -hmm. Two 78s used to get for about a penny. These are 78 records, <laughs> and anybody who can still remember records. That's one of my photographs. It closed in 1958, Plough. Somebody else has put a photograph of that on John Pinchbeck's site, Grand and Matters. Because that's a terraced house as well, isn't it? Yeah. There used to be coaching in because there was all stables at the back. Now, it belonged to somebody else, I think Soames or something like that. So at Mowbray's bought it in 1957 and closed it in 58. So I loved the frontage, didn't it, all them 
Yeah, it's beautiful. Base tiles. That's Welby Street. That's the plough here. Look, you just see the same door. It's not very good, but I've got it in because of this pub. The Welby Arms. So two pubs opposite each other in a tiny little... Yeah, in Street, Welby Street, Welby Street. Like that's John Lee's offices. More than that, there's a pub on that corner, Wolf Road Corner. And there was another pub further down Welby Street, so there's four pubs in Welby Street. Yeah. Was there any telly? <laughs> no, I don't think no tellys then. That would explain it. I think we had the first TV up Commercial Road. I mean, my father brought it, everybody come up to see the, um, the coronation in 1952. I should think there was hardly any TVs about. And that turned into Keith. Can you remember it? Was, it was oh, Keith's chip can't. shop. Where are we going now? This is the new inn. North oh, this Braid. is North Braid. And that's who contacted me, Trevor Lappage, friend of um, Pugs's. That was his bedroom, he tells me. I think his parents kept pubs, and that's as it is now, which is a couple of doors from Margaret Thatcher's shop. She perhaps went in there, but perhaps not, being a Methodist. Tea totals, aren't they? She might have gone in to tick them off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Norton Arms. So that's Norton Street, Dr. B. Yeah, corner of Norton Street, yeah. And that's not changed? No, it's very the same. I mean, what sort of people would have been able to afford to live here? Well, I should think it was all owned by Mowbrays. Right. I shouldn't think there was many private pubs. In Grantham. So did they build places that look like that to be pubs? Some of them must have been purpose built, suppose others were just converted from house. These are the censuses. I've tried going through all the, the old censuses, the 1851 up to the 1911 census, trying to find out who, who lived in the pubs during these years. So you've got all the way back to 1871? Yeah, I've done more on some pubs than I have others, and it's not always listed in the census as a no. pub, so you have to go through each page that was William Pisa, publican. So at least a hundred years the Norton Arms was a pub. Yeah, 1871 and it closed in 1970s. The Durham Marks, that's a, the other pub on the corner of Welby Street. It was the pot shop in the end. Can you remember it was the pot shop? So there's the Durham Marks, the plough, the Welby Arms, and someone tells me there was a little yard somewhere at the bottom, the other end of Welby Street, near Westgate, with a pub there. That's where you went for nightlife, isn't it, in Grantham, Welby Street. Welby Street, yeah, <laughs> it all happened down Welby Street. That's the Forester's Arms. In Castlegate? In Castlegate. That's facing the Conservative Club as you come out. Oh, that's a lovely building. And it's just a house now. Just a and house, can, yeah. And it's not changed that much, has it? No, no, except they had this um, fancy bit of work around the doorway took away. When do you think that one was taken? I think it's something to do with the coronation. It looks like the 1930s, doesn't it? That could be a private pub, because there's no brewery name on it. Perhaps it was not in Mo Mowbrays. There was a few Warwick's pubs from Newark. They owned a few in Grantham. That's the old Fox. I used to go there, the milk stout. That was a Warwick's pub. I used to go around there for my grandmother. I was only about ten then. That's when you could go and buy beer from a pub when you was ten. In 1911, Samuel Scotland was running that. And that is there's a photograph of it as it is now. So where's that looking at? This is looking up to uh, London Road. So, so it's one of these buildings here. My grandmother used to live next door which used to be a butcher's before she moved there and there was a slaughterhouse at the bottom of her passage. I don't know if anybody can remember that. She says when she lived there, I know this is not about pubs but they used to drive the sheep down there and, and Joe Duller used to live next door, the boxer. And in the end I think Clapton bought it at the side here, and it was all demolished then, the slaughterhouse. I didn't know there was ever a pub called The Reaper. That's another one that closed in 1958. Yeah, a lot of them closed in 1958. My mother was big friends of the people who kept The Reaper. This is a photograph I took, a sort of now, but I mean, some of these were took 15, 20 years ago. It's now a furniture shop, isn't it? Pacey had it as the plumbers, and that's the sign, The Reaper. You're very close to another pub, is I think there's a pub every few yards. Of course, over the road, there was the um, Barney Mo, so within a few yards. If you fell over in Grantham, you landed in a pub, didn't you? Yeah, you did, yeah. You never fell over inside one, though. You weren't allowed to, they would throw you out. Yeah. Now, that's in the marketplace, isn't it? It is, yeah. And that was the Blue Lion. Because that is a listed building, isn't it? It's in Pet House now. It is, yeah. It used to be called the White Lion before it changed to blue, like all the other pubs. And it was the White Lion in 1815, but it changed to the Blue Lion by 1822, closed in 1969. Another pub was Grand Bay. The only pub where you could get a drink on a Saturday at 4 o'clock. Railway Tavern changed its name to the Guildhall Tavern in 1962. Because it was facing the Guildhall? Yeah. It was Flowers then. They took over Mowbrays, didn't they? So I suppose there's new breweries. I thought of changing the names, I suppose, of pubs. Some of these, I can't find photographs of. 1936, oh, The Musician's Arms. The Musician's Arms. Never heard of that. The Six Wolf Road. No, it's only because I've gone through all old books trying to find any sort of references, but... So it closed in 1936. And you've traced it back to there? 1882, yes, but I have. Well, I found them on, in the 1881 census. Charles Green 
was running it in 1881. He was born in Ropsley. That's probably where you went for your live music then, in the musician's arms. Oh, it looks really busy. Yeah, I think there's some sort of event going on. And the old fellas, that was one of my favourite pubs. North Parade again. Yeah. Yeah, it closed in 1976, and you used to get served from a little hatch there. Oh, there was a photograph on John Pinchbeck's site inside it. You used to go down through, down the passage, through a little door there, and you used to get served at an hatch there. And I should think you could only get past ten people in that, it was that small. The door was in the passage here, but you used to go into a little, a little square where the doors packed into living accommodation. To the left, you used to go into the, through the bar, into the bar. I don't know if there was two rooms, but I only ever went in the one. William Strether. The old fellow's arms. Horses, traps and wagonettes. Yes, for hire and good stabling. So you could hire your transport there, stable your horses, have a beer and a fine cigar. Sounds like it. One of the best brands. Mm. So there must be stables at the back here somewhere, but of course that was New Street at the back, so... Because I used to walk, when all New Street was gone, we used to walk from the mother-in-laws across which was all just demolished and get into that way you used to then. George Tapp, the Glow, private run, Paul closed in 1921. It was run by the Burnett family from 1842 to 1901. And were they local? Yeah, well, there must have been, it must have been carried over that 60 odd years, the same family run, run it for, so it must be passed down from father to son. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, we've got an, we've got an old advert. I think that's one of the first adverts I've ever seen. A. Bushby. Yeah, so it wasn't the Burnett, so it must have been after 1901. It, it, so it's after 1901. It's Mowbray's by now, isn't it? Mowbray's yeah. Ales and Stout, Wines and Spirits of the finest quality. That must have been quite a smallish building, unless it went a long way back. That's in Butcher's Row, isn't it? I don't remember it being a pub. No, well, you wouldn't do, Ella. Swine Gate, so is there a pub there? There is, it's the Rose and Crown, two Swine Gate, which is actually next door to the um, Blue Pig. You didn't even have to walk hardly anywhere. <laughs> you could just go next door. Out of one door into the next, and that closed in 1959. This is a nice picture. A Mowbray's Dray, the Gildor. So that's about where the, the new cinema is now. I wonder where he was going. Ooh. He's got his penny on, look. Yeah, it looks like he's posing, probably. And his flat cap. Well, it's a nice shot with the, the Gildor. The Gildor, perhaps that's why they stopped there, so there's some sort of reference point. There was, I don't know if you can remember, it was all gardens, weren't they? What used to be where the doctors is now, that big house, there's all gardens at the back with old fruit trees and there's a little, wa the little wall here still here and then about ten yards further back there's a taller wall six, seven foot tall and if you used to climb over there there's all the gardens and apple trees I remember going in there scrumping and then the other side of the wall was the old stone wall which was between the gardens and the, the bus station cross swords that's the little one that closed in 1958 on the high street You've got a lot of information on that one it's a shame it was over demolished because it was a stone building and look what they built in its place, because it was connected to the Asian and Royal. Oh, isn't that a shame? It's all done in the same stone. That was James Burkett was running it then, across swords, and he was born at Marston. And you get back further than that, all the censors going back. There's an 1831 for Grantham. Is there? The only surviving, and there's not many in the old of the country. And there's the 1841, but it didn't state where they was born. So uh, is this a list of all the people that ran it? No, these are all the people who was living in it. At the one time? Yeah. Because there could be quite, hotels, there's a lot oh, of lodging I houses see. then and pubs, weren't there? I was just thinking People. there was quite a lot going on there. Yeah. So they Best came from Kent. far and wide they did. to stay at the Cross Swords. Yeah, I suppose this was the height of the Industrial Revolution, the perhaps was coming here to work at um, Hornsby's and of course it was on the main A1, wasn't it, the road? You know, we're saying there was an awful lot of pubs, Yeah. but they would get an awful lot of passing traffic, wouldn't they? They would, yeah. The Blue Sheep, that, is that Marketplace? And these are the two that was demolished. The butter market and the blue sheep, and there's the conduit. And that's the road now. Yes, yeah, the through road there. through there. Yeah. Was it built that size? Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it's Small. such a thin little house. It looks like a slice of cake. 1915, that was closed. Caroline Darby was running it then. So a lady was running it in, in 1881. Yeah, she was born in Sleaford. Somewhere there's a photograph of the um. The blue. You're making these up. You think how? No. <laughs> blue, 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 everything. The blue boat. Old Wharf Road. That closed in 1935. The Georgian three tons. Yeah, and there was another three tons as well. But I think some of these was demolished when perhaps Hornsby's was built. Because the only reference I could find for it, with it for it was 1842. The three horseshoes in East Street. In 1881 it was called Well Lane then. And Robert Dent was running it. Born at Lenton. The Shepherd and Dog, that are owned by Buckminster Estate. Yeah, he perhaps owned all the ones that were 
changed the name to Blue. That's in Wide Westgate. This is up Dysart Road. That's the Blue Bull there. So you've got about four shops to, before you got to the next pub. In 1881, Robert Fowler was running that. He was an innkeeper and kettle dealer. Born at Southwick, the Saracen's Head, the Wheat Sheaf in Inner Street. I think a lot of people have seen that photograph. It closed in 1938. And in 1881, John Mason was running that. He came from Wilford. It seems to have pulled in people from all the villages around. Yeah, it did. Grantham was just growing and growing as a, as a centre for yeah. everybody to live. Yeah, with Ornsby's there, Marcos, everything like that. There must have been a massive influx of people. I suppose that's why more and more pubs kept open. Is that the pub, the Telegraph? Yeah, I don't know when it opened or closed or anything. The that was Telegraph, Telegraph in Inner Street, Inner Street. Clown and Albert Street. It closed in 1964 and I can't remember it. I, I can't, can't remember, remember the building. It. I've heard of this one. The Bricklayer's Arms. The Bricklayer's Arms That's in another 48. one that closed in 1958. There's massive amounts of them. I don't know what happened to everybody in 1958. They must have been running around looking for pubs. And the Brewer's Arms, I've no photograph of that. That was up Brewery Hill. I think that was demolished during the war when all the bombs dropped across Commercial Road. I suppose that what was, in the end, the Brewery Yard, they extended it all the way down Brewery Hill and the top of Commercial Road. Because my mother was in the house of Commercial Road when the bomb dropped. She was buried for 12 hours. Was she? Yeah, they had to dig her out. I think there was quite a few killed in it, but mother was wet under a table. And of course, there the house is now, as you come out of Fletcher Street, and you can see wood lines. There was houses all the way there where that was wood lines yard. Yeah. Steel Cap. Yeah, changed its name to the Blue Sheep. Demolished in 1850, where it was, I do not know. Flowers took over Mowbray's. Dragon's Blood. That sounds yeah. like a good brew. It does, doesn't it? Staple Stout. Brewmaster, poacher, light ale. Uh, that's a good address, isn't it? The brewery, yeah, Grantham. Yeah, well, it was the only brewery then, wasn't it? Because there used to be two breweries, Redhead's Brewery, that was at the back of the um, Barney Mo. And William Redhead, I don't know if the brewery was first, or the Barney Mo was first, but it was connected. He run the Barney Mo and the brewery. Then um, Mowbray's took them over, closed it down, and I think it was a wine and beer store. It used to go, I don't know if you can remember the building, on Rycroft Street, as you went at the side of the Barley Mow. Yes. Turn right, there's that long building there, wasn't it? The taxis had it. And it was then the North Road garages, I think, had it as well. And that's where they used to store the spirits and wine. What's this one? This is a Square and Compass. Everybody asked me where the Square and Compass was. And it was up James Street. Now it's Premier Court. It used to be crossroads that run through it. So if you stand at the Nobody Inn, yes, you stand at Nobody Inn, look straight across the Premier Court, that road, you would see that road there. This was North Street, this was Broad Street, this is Brook Street. And that looks like just converted from somebody's house. And that's Sir Isaac Newton, the old Sir Isaac Newton. That closed in 1927. It was owned by Mowbray's. The license was transferred to the Earthfield Arms. Blue Anchor, that was in Westgate. It's still there now, that building, because these are the West End Cottages, which was demolished. This is a very centre. serious looking gathering. It is, yeah. Do you think I, I think this was it, just as the I war think was during breaking the war, out. yeah, because they've all got the uniforms on, haven't they? That closed in 1961. Yeah, Henry Robinson was running that then, in 1881. Blacksmith and a publican. I didn't know there was a pub on South Braid. Greyhound, yeah. Well, that must have been a house. Some of these may have opened up just as a pub. Perhaps just during the First World War, with everybody then, thousands of men at Belton, weren't they? Of course, that's another pub at East Street, which could be the renamed from the other. The Hare and Hounds, yeah. East Street. And the Molders Arms. Molders. Yeah, I suppose that perhaps was built for um, Hornsby's, because they had a moulding shop up there, didn't they? Up Spring Gardens. And the Lord Nelson. I haven't got a photograph of that, and I can remember going in there. It's going to be Hillfort. It's going to be Hillfort, yeah. Of course, there's a, a lot of moultings in town, wasn't it? In Grantham, there was, must have been 20 maltings or more, besides the brewery, which was quite labour intensive as well. Gold Lion in Castlegate, the Flying Horse. In Watergate. That's an interesting one. The Atrusses, and that was down East Street as well, but we've already seen the other two pubs down East Street, so they could have been just renamed so they, or they may not have they been. started t- out as a hay trusser. Yeah. The Woolpack. Yeah. And it's not Emmerdale. No, definitely not. Another one down Welby Street. So you've got it back to, where's that, 1881? Yeah. Peacock, another one down Welby Street, closed in 1937. James Hughes was running that then, an innkeeper, age 70. I'm sitting with Linda and John Senior from the Lord Harrowby pub. I'm Ella Watts for Gravity FM Heritage Project. 
Now, John, you've been in pubs for a long time. Your parents had pubs when you were younger. I started off in a little old-fashioned pub called the Robin Hood in Sutton in Ashfield. It was a bit of a run-down dive, but due to hard work and effort by my mother, mainly. It was a thriving little pub, but unfortunately redevelopment made sure that they couldn't keep in that pub, so they had to vacate it. Well, I know you worked in pubs while you were going through college, and eventually one day you ended up in Grantham, didn't you? I did. And the first pub you took there would be the Isaac Newton? Correct, on uh, top there of Holliston Road. It was a marvellous experience. I always look back fondly on my time at the Isaac Newton. Very nice people and sociable people. One anecdote here I always remember is that Mark Hill's staff used to come in every day for the lunches and they used to get a couple of guys come in and one day they came in and sat far away down the bar from each other, just nodded to each other and carried on reading the paper and having the lunch and went out. This went on for quite a few weeks and one day I just got fed up of it and I said, hello Jim, meet Fred. Fred, meet Jim. And from that day onwards, there was inseparable. So bringing people together through the medium of drink <laughs> sounds good to me. So when did you move to the Blue Bull? Yeah, we moved there in uh, about October 86. I thought it was going to be a Mansfield tied house. Went through all the rigmarole of a interview with Mansfield Brewery. Got the pub, got the backing of my parents as well, who was sort of my guarantors. Moved in in 86. Again, it was a beautiful pub. A lot of hard work done by the previous tenant. It's a very old pub, isn't it? Very old pub. It's one of the last remaining blue pubs in town, which is, I think is a great shame. It was a wonderful pub in our time. A lot of hard work. But again, it was an old pub. Watling and Darb Walls. I always remember the first time I ever tried to drill a hole in the upstairs, tying a picture up, and it went straight through. <laughs> it was actually a hotel before it was a pub. It was. It was uh, about 1860s, I think, if memory serves me rightly. It was classed as Wagoners pub called the Cattle Market Hotel. Obviously, because they're close proximity to the cattle market, and the wagoners used to come in down on market days, which in them days I think was Thursdays and Saturdays, bringing in goods to sell and people to buy goods to take back with them. And it was very busy, from what I can recall from talking to other people. And there was a resident ghost. There was a resident ghost. He used to sort of taunt us at times. He was a, supposed to be a barman who sort of had a fit of depression one night and hanged himself in the loft, or as it was then, it was the uh, staff quarters. We used to have fun and games at times, see little strange things and things used to move around. Still can't explain why. Did you have experience of this ghost, Linda? The only experience of a ghost that I ever had was in the cellar, and that was actually a dog, and it ran past me as I was changing a barrel, which startled me very much. But after that, I very often used to see, not the full dog, but just the back end with the tail scampering through the cellar. The back end of a dog? Yes, yeah. and it was quite amusing. Tell me about your new barman. You know, the new barman, uh, we set a young lad up and one day he came to us asking for a job and we knew him from a personal friend of ours and we set him on. He was getting on quite well, but one busy Saturday night, a customer came to the bar, ordered a pint of bitter, a pint of lager and a Bacardi or a vodka and they asked for the top off a bottle of Coke. A couple of minutes later, the customer shouted me over and said, what's this? And I looked and said, quizzically, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, look where he's given me. And in his hand, he held the crown cork top off a bottle of Coke, which he'd give to the customer, and put the bottle of Coke back away in the, on the shelf. <laughs> oh, well, we did laugh. Linda, you took a break from pubs around about 2000? I did, yeah. So why did you decide to leap back in? The Lord Harrowby became our local. I love the little pub. It's an old-fashioned pub. The previous landlord decided to retire, and I don't know why. I just got a beer in my bonnet that I wanted that pub. And here I am, I've got it. So you, you took the pub over in 2011? I did. And that's another one with a lot of history. It has got a lot of history. I mean, apparently it was a farmhouse hundreds of years ago, before any of the houses on Dudley Road were built. It existed as a farmhouse. The rear beer garden was actually stables. And that, too, has a resident ghost. It's not the front end of the dog, is it? <laughs> no, it is reportedly a lady that was trampled on by horses in the stables. Linda, tell me a little bit more about this ghost in the Lord Harrowby. Well, I personally haven't seen her, but she's reported to appear on the landing in the flat upstairs. I have a customer that comes in 
called Philly Huns. When he was a teenager, his mother had the pup, and Philly, in the middle of the night, opened his bedroom door and saw a figure of a lady in a long skirt and an old-fashioned bonnet. Many years later, he was drinking in the pub, and someone produced an old photograph of a lady in a long skirt and a bonnet. Philly took one look and said, that is the lady I saw all those years ago. And every few weeks now, Philly will ask me, have you seen the ghost, Linda? And I haven't, not yet. But if I'm there on my own late at night and I have to go up the stairs to the flat, I always peer round the corner as I'm going up to see if she might appear. It's a place where we hold the beer festival with the live music and bands, etc. Well, there's a very impressive display of kegs. Oh, yes, I set it all up for outside for the beer festival in the May, Bay, May Day Bank Holiday Beer Festival, which was a, quite a good success, and I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed themselves. And I know certainly I enjoyed myself because the bands was fantastic, and we had some good weather. Which is very and it rare. was a bit of a fundraiser, wasn't it? It was a fundraiser for the Spire Appeal, which we collected £117, I think it was, That's over the two wonderful. days, three days that were there, which are big applause to all the people that came, helped us out with it, and I thank them very much for the generosity. Do you do any, what you would call, home brewing yourself? I don't do any. I've tried it in the past, but I'm not up to the uh, standards that are required by today's discerning customer. It is an interesting subject to talk about, and I can talk about it for hours, especially the real ale side. The real ale, it, this is camera, is this, it? This is what camera was set up for in 72, to save us from, from the keg revolution, which at today's date and time, camera's done a very successful job because nowadays it's the rarity to find real ale not in a pub. And that is all down to the members of CAMRA, the organisation, which stands for the Campaign for Real Ale. Is it a big thing in Grantham? CAMRA itself is a big thing. We've just hit the 200 membership mark. Uh, we're a successful social group as well as a, a successful campaigning group. Again, if it wasn't for CAMRA, you wouldn't be going into pubs in Grantham selling real ale in the format it is today. Lord Harrowby, Linda and myself are heavily involved with saving our spire. When it first came up about April of last year 2012. Older Shores were in the process of producing a beer called Summit. I thought that was a good idea that Save Our Summit was a bit of a mouthful so I saved it to Save Our Spire. I call it SOS but the beer was on at last year's beer festival in May. We had a collection for it, a donation for it for every, every pint sold. We, saw it, we donated 10p per pint and we also had bottle ales that we, people could purchase and the price of that also went to starting the fund off for Save the Spire. Linda, tell me about last Christmas. Well, all year we'd been collecting for Save the Spire. We have a large whisky bottle on the bar for people to throw their loose change in. The bottle got full and so several members of St Wolfram's Church came down one Saturday afternoon to count the money in the jar and at the same time, we decided to have a carol service. There was quite a lot of members from St Wolfram's and some of our regular customers, and we all went into the bar, and after the money had been counted, we all sang some carols and said a few prayers and just had a, a Christmas gathering, and it was absolutely marvellous. So hopefully this year we'll be able to do the same thing again and we'd like to make it an annual event every Christmas to have a Christmas service in the bar at the Lord Harrowby. My name's Pugsy Parker, helping support the Heritage Project at Gravity and this is my little bit of knowledge of the Grantham drinking scene. I'm probably the last bloke that can talk about drink because I'm such a lightweight over the years. Never been able to drink. I'm the only bloke probably in Grantham now that goes dark and has a cup of tea. I'm now 58 years old. And I remember back in the day, I was six, and a bloke called Ron Sheridan, quite well known in the football circles he, he was, he took me up to Barford's Club. A lot of people will remember Barford's as Arnold Field, but they used to have a club just inside the gate. As you went up Oaten Road, you went through the gate, and the, just to the left, there was a club that used to go in, and now Ron took me there. And I always remember it for the simple reason that I went home just after 11, and Mum and Dad still hadn't run for the police. They was worried where I was, but they never did know about it. But that was my first time I ever went in a drinking place, and I say that was Barford's Club. I w went to live down Alford Street just after I was six, and of course I lived next door as close as you can to the wagon living in Alford Street. 
And in them days, if I remember rightly, it belonged to Sam and Marion Tolson, I think the surname was. And that was where I was initiated onto my first pint by my good friend, Mr. Mark Tilford. And we went in and told Sam that I was 18. And I was 17, but he thought it was my 18th birthday, so that's where my first pint was. And I was much in awe of the darts teams down there. They had very good darts teams down at the wagon. Uh, there was the Tilfords, the Berridges. I'm just trying to think of one or two more that just don't come into my head. But there was another feature in the wagon that always used to amaze me. There was a, a bloke called Ollie Story that used to be part of the Story family that did the coal delivered round. And he used to come in some Monday nights. He was never he didn't play darts right with him, but he'd come in and Sunday dinners. And he did a thing they used to call walk in the bottles. Now I think this could be revamped today because I think this was fantastic. And that was where you'd stand against the, the door or the wall, you'd squat down and you'd have a, a pint bottle, in them days, say a forest brown, and you would walk the bottles. And what I mean, one in each hand, and you'd walk out horizontally, and then you'd stretch with one hand to put one bottle out, and then you'd have to utch back without touching the floor on the other. Probably that's not the best description, but believe you me, that was one mean feat and I'd love to see see it done today. And then things changed because I mean when I started going to the wagon it had a front door off Manthorpe Road which got bricked up and the lads, a lot of them went up to the Gables and I followed them for a while but my alliances to Forest was more than there was to Manchester United and I can stake this claim and before anybody phones in or says that they started, myself, the Tilfords and McCoys and all them first started the football team up the Gables because we got a couple of friendlies and Mick always was renowned for being a footballer and we had a few friendlies where people went footballing on a Sunday morning, we'd meet at the Gables, we'd go off footballing and even played in jeans and the work boots. That was the original Gables but when it became affiliated then obviously it all goes down to the, the late Alan Fardell and certain people that made it a proper football club. I've just thought of a place that I used to go when I was 16. It was called the 69 Club, and I used to go there quite regular. The 69 Club was a scooter club at Gunnerby, just next door to the recruiting sergeant, which now is the, has got a, like a courtyard with a few houses and flats in. Well, that used to be a car park, and on stilts above there used to be the 69 Club. The late Jeff Dixon, bless him, had something to do with it. But we all used to go up there on our scooters and we had some great times up there. So uh, that was that era. I used to meet every Sunday at the Reindeer where we had a football team. And the reason I mentioned the Reindeer football team is it really was a pub of ways and strays for football. We had a great team. We really was like the Fen Street game, but we took a lot of beating because in them days, which is sadly now gone, is the Isaac Newton. I rode past there the other day and I thought, well, I see that pub develop and I've seen it go. But they used to have all the uh, the good players. Again, some of the names elude me, but you listeners will remember, but in the days that I played, there was Puss Parker, Roger Booth and all them, and these was all good players in the day. And we used to have this Sunday morning unaffiliated league and they used to beat us, but we was always runners up and it was, it was good times, good times. Then I used to also, because I lived near the Five Bells, well, a lot of you may have used the five bells. It used to have a function room at the back. I remember the old Shirley Croft. I played darts there. One of the pubs I really liked was the Barley Mow. Uh, I can't get any history. I can't tell you any stories about the Barley Mow. Other than it was on London Road on the corner of Rycroft Street. It was quite a, a good pub for gathering. But now I've got to come to one or two funny stories. And this one's to do with the, uh, the Springfield Arms. The end of Hunting Tower Road on Springfield Road. I'd only be... 16 or 17 and uh, I decided that I'd got to go to the toilet so I went to the toilet and there I'm stood minding my own business and all of a sudden these two blokes walked through the door well it must have been Spider-Man because all of a sudden there I'm stood next to my head is his two feet and he's got his hands behind the condom machine on the wall his mates the other side and they just ripped the cover clean off the condom machine. And I just stood there. And I mean, it must have been the longest time I've been at the toilet because I didn't move. 
they just come from nowhere. And off the wall come the machine, 10 peas everywhere. They took all the 10 peas and a few of the condoms that come out as well, and off they went. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what, I just went back in, I says, you've not believed what I'm going to tell you. But I did also pick up a few of the condoms, because they might have had a use. I've probably still got them with my look. I used to work at Coles Cranes, as a lot of you know. And of course, Coles Club was up Dyset Road at the top end near the A1. It later become the Huntsman, I think. But because I worked at Coles, like Contacts, like Barfords, Backy Lugs, we all had a clubs and into shop darts and all this, that and the other. But in them days, we used to have some decent shows. I mean, one year, they had the Mersey Beats. And that in them days also, you had strippers. Uh, you had everything at these clubs. That was part and parcel of factory life in Grantham with all the factories. I mean, that, that was a benefit in them days. And I always remember Marty Kane. Uh, she come to Cole's club. Marty Kane was doing her act and so there's always somebody. And this particular night it was Jock Watt giving her a bit of barrack. And she just turned around and she says, Do you know what my friend says? If I could afford the wood, I'd have your mouth boarded up. But uh, yeah, it was a good days, Cole's club. Usually ended up Friday night disco. That was in the days when you had discos at Coles, discos at Arnoldfield, Marcos, Vaculugs, and of course there was the After 8, and some of you will name more and more. This is mainly the early 70s to mid 70s. Of course you move on, and the, I used to say, to play a lot of darts, I always remember playing the Hunting Tower, which was rung by Jerry. Can't think of Jerry's surname now and his wife, but they used to have a very little back room for the darts. And I could never play darts down there unless I'd put about three or four quid in the jukebox. And one record I always used to put on in there was Oh What A Night, December 63 or whatever, by the Four Seasons. And uh, I'd put that on three or four times. Great pub, the Hunting Tower. Again, sadly, as I've mentioned, one or two, the wagon's gone, the hunt is now gone. These places, which was pretty good in the day, are all disappearing. Time went by, I got into the hospital club. The hospital club, obviously, again, used to have functions, discos, pay nurses, disco. That was a full night. I always remember there used to be a, a lad called, a bloke called Bachelor. We used to call him Del Boy. Great guy. Anybody who went to the hospital club will mem- remember him. There we are, Grantham Hospital Club, Friday night, collapses in the floor in the hallway. What did we have to do? We had to wait for an ambulance. We had to wait 20 minutes to half an hour. We could have piggybacked him. We could have shouldered him. We could have done anything. But we couldn't move him, we had to wait for an ambulance. But he did survive, and the ironic thing about that is he had an heart attack at about 9 o'clock. At 3 o'clock in the morning, he walked along Manthorpe Road in his gown, um, because he won't stop in. And of course, again, the hospital club's now gone, and we've had the Chicago, which was great fun. I used to go a lot to the Spread Eagle. The, the reason I went to the Spread Eagle was I worked at Storage and Ornage back in the 80s. And that was up, was it up Norton Street? There used to be the Victoria, which was run by Hollings with the driving instructor. He used to have a massive military type of uh, moustache. But the Spread Eagle, we always gathered in there once a fortnight before we went to work at Storage and Orridge. Every Friday dinner, we went in there for a dinner. The ladies as well, the office staff used to meet us in there. All of you will have your own stories. Fantastic times at Christmases, the meetings in the town of all the factories meeting, like the Black Dog, the White Art and the High Street was very much an open house for everybody. There's so many stories to tell about, so many places. So that's Pugsy Parker signing off for Gravity FM 97.2. I'm here with Simon Craythorn at the Blue Cow Pub and Brewery at South Witham. It's been running as a pub since 1604. Simon, how long have you been here? Eight years. Enjoying it? Very much so indeed, yes. So you're going to unravel the mystery of brewing a little bit? Yes, indeed. Um, first piece of equipment is called the hot liquor tank. A little bit of a snobby kind of word because it's actually only a giant kettle. It warms the water to approximately 75 degrees centigrade. Uh, the next piece of equipment we've got is called the mash tun. Uh, mash is a combination of grain and hot water. Looks a little bit like porridge but that's the first part of the brewing process. 75 degree water mixed with the grain, which has been crushed just to break the skins, allows us then to get the hot sugary liquid out of the grain. What grain are you using here? We use barley, 
a very small amount of wheat and something called crystal, which is actually a malted barley, which has been heat treated to give it a sort of marshmallowy, come caramel, come toffee kind of flavour, which is one of the flavourings you get in the end product. Okay, so from the mash tun, where do we go then? Basically, we drain off all the liquid and leave the grain solids in the mash tun. It's the hot, syrupy liquid that we use to make the beer. We then put that into what's called the copper, although there's no copper in it. It's actually just a stainless steel boiling vessel where we put the liquid with our hops and we then boil it so we get the flavour from the hops. Any danger involved here? No, it's similar to using a giant kettle, so you've just got to be careful you've got hot liquid, but nothing else really. There's no chemicals or no uh, additives or anything involved. It is just hot. And would that years ago, would that have been made of copper? Is that why they call it the copper? I guess so, yes. Many, many years ago, it would have been an easier metal for people to have used back hundreds of years ago. Beer is a very, very old product. Um, it has been shown that Romans, etc., did drink beer and brewed in a very similar process to the way we do it now. Okay, so what happens from there then, Simon? Right, once it's had its full hour boiling, that is to sterilise the liquid and to get the flavour out of the hops, we then actually let it out into what's called an underbath, which is a vessel just actually to hold the liquid for a short while, where we add some extra hops to give it a slightly fresher flavour. You get the deep, heavy flavours boiled into the liquid. You then get slightly more fragrant and less uh, boiled in flavours through just steeping the hot liquid for five minutes with the fresh hops. Once we've actually carried out that part of the process, we then pump all of the liquid, excluding the hops, into what's called the fermentation vessel. We cool the liquid down, we add yeast, and once we add the yeast, we leave it for five days. Once it's actually been for five days, bubbling away, looks a little bit like a sort of blancmange on the top with the liquid underneath. I'm sure people who've got done homemade wine or homemade beer know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a really thick, bubbly froth all over the top looking like Remange. Once it's had that part of the process, we cool it all down. Once we get it below 17 degrees, it will actually stop fermenting. We cool it down again until 13 degrees, at which point we can actually put the first lot of finings into the beer. What are finings? Finings are actually a natural, chemi- or natural product. Uh, we actually use the swim bladder of the sturgeon fish which is a sort of slightly oily product that actually clings to all the little tiny pieces that are in the beer, maybe the hop seeds or the little tiny pieces of barley or wheat, and it actually gathers them all together and makes a sort of thick, gooey uh, sludge that sinks to the bottom. So we end up with sediment and clear beer. So vegetarians can't drink this beer then? Not this particular one, but there are other products we can use if we need to. But we we don't because sturgeon fish um, swim bladder is actually the best at the moment for that. You can get artificial products that are vegetarian and vegan friendly, but we don't currently use those as they are artificial and have additives that would mean our beer is um, not additive free. Do you have to keep taste testing it, Simon? We don't taste test it at all at this point. What we do is we actually watch the product, we look at what it's doing. Once we've actually got to the point where all the sludge is at the bottom, we can then actually transfer all the beer down into our cellar, which is under the pub and kept under lock and key. Once it's been put into a barrel and we've actually put the second lot of fining in, we can then actually call it beer and we taste it. It won't taste how it should taste until we actually manage to get it into a barrel. So it is a little bit trial and error, although we watch for the signs to make sure it's working properly and doing what it should do. We've not had many failures yet though. But is there a variation in the taste slightly? Not barrel to barrel. From batch to batch that we produce, slightly, but because we use exactly the same quantity of ingredients, and I use the ingredients from a very well-known supplier who is very, very stable with their ingredients, we tend to get very similar. Although being a natural product, obviously you do get minor variations. The strength is always exactly the same because the strength is determined by when I start and stop the beer and how syrupy it was to start with and how far it's actually fermented. So the strength is always exactly the same, but the flavour may be just slightly different, the colour may be just slightly different, but very, very small amounts, really. How do you test the strength of the beer? Right. We actually use something called a hygrometer, um, and what that does is it actually is measured for the density of the liquid. There's more sugar dissolved in the liquid, and when I say sugar, it's a naturally occurring sugar from the grain. The more that's in there, the higher up the graduated scale on my little dipping stick. 
once we actually fermented the beer and the sugar's been eaten by the yeast, that obviously then drops further down my scale and I can actually tell the difference between the starting point and the finishing point determines how much alcohol is in there. Okay, what do you do with the sludge that's left at the bottom? Is that, that like that a manure? No, that, no, 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 no. There's only a very small amount of that. That actually gets washed away. It really isn't any good to anybody. Um, it is literally just all the bits and pieces that nobody really wants. It is slightly bitter and therefore we have to get rid of it out of the beer otherwise your beer would be particularly bitter. So it's really a waste product. But there is only probably half a bucket full at the end of the brewing session. All oh, right, I was, I was imagining there would oh, be no, a no, load no, at no, the no, bottom no, no, of no, here. No, 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 no. Do you use fresh hops or dried hops? We use fresh hops. They come from a company down in Herefordshire. I know Kent seems to be the garden of England and has always traditionally been hop country. At the moment, the, the hops from there aren't particularly good quality due to things like mildews and um, fungal infections, although I think in the future they will get over that. At the moment, Worcestershire and Herefordshire are the two best areas of the country for hop production. Okay. Can you get the fresh hops all year round? Oh yes, definitely yes. Um, hops, what they tend to do is if they feel that the, the season is dragging out a little bit, what they will do is they will actually dry them and vacuum pack them. And when you rehydrate them in the liquid, they, are, they just come back to how they were fresh. It's not ideal, but it is a very, very good way of doing it. Mm. Hop flowers will actually deteriorate quite quickly if they're not used as quickly as possible. What are the beers called? That we just do the one beer at the moment, which is called South Witham Blue Cow Best Bitter. It's a 4% beer, and it is a dark brown coloured beer. Very hoppy, very Moorish, proper traditional English ale is the best way of describing it. Um, it's not one of these newfangled sort of citrus flavour or anything silly like that. We try and do it as traditionally as we can. No additives, no flavourings as such, just natural ingredients, how it should be made. Very good seller indeed. I would think we probably sell in excess of 300 pints a week. Excellent. When you took the pub over, Simon, and yes. you, you obviously realised that it came with a brewery, did you think, oh my goodness, or was it kind of a bit of a challenge for you? It was a challenge to begin with, only from the point of view I'd never brewed before, but um, it is a bit like making cakes, really. If, as long as you follow the recipe and you follow the timings, it all comes together in the end. And it well, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> oh, with the brewing, it always has with me, I have to say. I mean, we only brew approximately once a month, and we take care of what we're doing. And I've got to say, it, it's a process we just watch. You can see it, and you just have a feeling that it's right. I suspect you can't burn the beer like you can burn a cake, though. Not quite, no. no. The, the, the biggest problem you can have is if you get the water too hot at the beginning of the process, the starch in the grain will come out into the liquid once you've got the starch coming out instead of the sugar it will always be cloudy won't affect the taste but it will always look cloudy always look a bit uh, a bit dreary and a bit dull so it's always something we're really careful on is actually make sure that the temperature is correct so the whole process how long does it take simon from having dry grain and a bucket of water basically to finished product i would like 10 days i can get away with probably eight if i really really need to but that is cutting a few little sort of time corners better for about 10 days that's very quick really isn't it when you buy these home brewing kits yeah. they take a bit longer than they that they do take longer i'm not quite sure why they, t they take longer my my way of doing it is very very quick it takes approximately six hours to actually do the main production part of it three to five days to actually ferment, a day cooling down and then a couple of days for the beer to actually settle in the barrel. So you're looking at around about 10 days. Excellent. And what sort of money does this kit cost? It, it, yeah. it is very expensive, I'm afraid. Yes, it is quite specialist equipment. Um, you can pick up second-hand sets for probably 10 to 20,000 pounds on a very small scale. If you start going for the much larger scale where you're doing it semi sort of uh, commercially to sell on a regular basis you are going to be looking at a hundred thousand pounds minimum i won't be doing it any day soon then simon good good so thank you ever so much That's it's been right. lovely lovely talking to you thank you I'm Ella Watts for Gravity FM and I'm at the Aldershaw Brewery, which is on Heath Lane, Boxton Heath near Grantham. I'm talking to Cathy Britton, who is managing partner of Aldershaw's Brewery. Well, thank you for talking to me, Cathy. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of Aldershaw's Brewery? The brewery was established in 1996. It was set up as a hobby brewery in the garage of uh, Gary and Diane Aldershaw. 
Gary was a keen hobby brewer. He then turned it into a five-barrel brewing plant and then increased the size again in about 1997 up to a nine-barrel brewery, which it is today. My husband and I, Tim Britton, took over the brewery in 2010 and we tried to grow the brewery and to move it off-site from, uh, from the, the garage, which was kind of expanded and, expanded and extended. Uh, just outgrow the premises. Now we're here in Barton Heath in a very lovely, fabulous, huge new building uh, with increased capacity to create about another 5,000 pints of beer a week if we, uh, if we can sell that much. So it's a very exciting time for us. Kathy, how many people do you employ? So we have three full-time employees. We have one driver, one salesman and a full-time brewer. And we also employ a part-time sales lady and we also have a part-time administrator that comes in and helps out as and when she can and myself and then my husband does evenings and weekends because he has a sensible job in London so he commutes in every day from Grantham. What about in olden times? I understand most of the employees were women then. That's right. In previous times the uh, female of the house would be in charge of making the beer. It tied into them making the bread and being in the kitchen, so the yeast would have been used to make the beer as well. And uh, they were actually called Brewsters. And I'm involved in a project called Project Venus, which is a collaboration of female brewers or Brewsters from all around the country, getting together at each other's breweries every so often and uh, putting together a slightly different brew each time and selling that out under the Project Venus label. Tell me a little bit about your beers, because you've won a lot of awards looking around the office. We have. We've won a huge number of awards over the years for all of our different beers, and we're very, very proud of them. The most recent award was the National uh, Silver Medal we won for our Great Expectations beer, which was brewed in honour of Charles Dickens' birthday last year. And that's a 4.2 golden beer, and we are brewing that now on a regular basis. Um, but loads of our other beers have won awards as well. We've won with Regal Blonde, uh, Blonde Volupta and Alchemy are uh, winners quite often. And we're just hoping this year that our Heavenly Blonde, which is now our best-selling beer, which is a 3.8 uh, Pale Golden Session beer, is going to be one of, our, one of the award-winning beers because, as I say, that's one of our most popular brews. And are there a lot of places locally you can get one of your beers? There are. Most of the pubs in Grantham are very loyal to us and stock most of our beers and beers from all the three Grantham breweries on a regular rotating basis. Our beers are also widely available uh, locally in Lincoln, Sleaford, Nottingham and we deliver out to about a 100 mile radius. We've just actually started going into London as well, just into North London. And we also deal with a wholesaler based in Lincoln called Small Beer and they're able to get our beers out nationally. So. We can get our beers pretty much anywhere in the country now. Beer travels a lot further now. That's something to do with hops, isn't it? That's right. Previously, um, hops weren't actually used in beer, and that was why the beer was called ale, which means a, a beer brewed with, without using hops. Since the introduction of hops, they have antibacterial qualities, and they mean that beer is much more stable, and it's much more sterile, and therefore it's able to travel much further before it goes, goes off. How far has your beer travelled? The furthest I believe it's travelled is to France, but uh, so most of it's about a 100 mile radius. And you've just done a very special beer for London, haven't you? That's right. We've just been working in collaboration with the St Pancras Hotel in London. We've worked with them for about six months, designing and developing a bespoke beer purely for that hotel. Uh, it is, however, available from the brewery also. They're very happy for it to be sold independently as well, or it can be found on the booking office bar and restaurant uh, bar in, in St Pancras Hotel in North London, literally by St Pancras Station. It's a 4.6 lager-style beer, hops traditionally with some German and European and American hops as well. It's a very refreshing beer. So if any of the local businesses want a special beer for their business, they need to come and see you? They certainly need to come and have a conversation with us, yes. We're very willing to look at all, all possibilities. If, if the company's the right size and it's for the right events, we certainly can see what we can do. You've made one to do with the Mallard, I believe. That's right. We've just brewed a beer called Loco 126, which is to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Mallard steam train hitting its 126 miles an hour, which was just outside Grantham. Hello, Gary. Nice to meet you. How are you? I've got my recorder switched on. Oh, is right. that okay? Yeah, of course. Do you want to tell me what I'm looking at here? You're looking at uh, our empty casks at the moment. Um, dirty casks coming in on this side of the building. We then rinse the slops out of them on a weekly basis, which is a very smelly and at this time of year dirty job as well. Once the rinse, what I'm doing today is that I've actually been cleaning them. So I've been removing the labels, cleaning any dirt off the outside, stacking them down that end ready for use. And that's this week's production. So they've got to be cleaned. So it's dirty, rinsed this side, and then they're clean. And as soon as we sterilise them, 
on Monday and Tuesday next week they go straight through into the brew house ready for use. It's a, it's a long, long, slow process at the moment, but hopefully a new, more automated cast cleaning machine will be coming this year. So do you have tours of the brewery going on? Not officially at the moment, but we have done one or two small-scale tours. In fact, a few weeks ago we had the guys from the Royal Naval Air Service based at Yeovilton who are actually learning to fly out of Cranwell and Barkston Heath at the moment. They came down for a look and uh, a quick tour round and a few sample tastings. And partially as a result of that, we've managed to get business with the officer's mess, one of the officer's messes in RAF Cranwell. Cathy, you've got some royal pictures around the office. That's right, we have some pictures of Prince Charles pulling a pint of our beer. This is taken at the Chumley Arms in Burton the Coggles as part of a scheme called Pub is the Hub, of which Prince Charles is patron. Uh, Pub is the Hub is an organisation which tries to revitalise struggling areas of communities, so if your pub is slightly run down and need of a bit of a facelift or needs to be re-established as the heart of the community or your shop or your post office, any part of the community life that wants to be re revitalised, uh, there is funding available from Pub is the Hub to help uh, communities re-establish their core and their heart. We believe that the pub is an important place in our society. It's a safe, convivial atmosphere to enjoy a drink or a meal, um, or a meal with a drink, or vice versa. And they're basically at the heart of the community, and we think they shouldn't be underestimated. And we are very, very happy to support pubs wherever we can. So, Cathy, you do events as well? We do run occasional bars for various festivals. We have just done a bar at the Folk Festival, organised by Libby Simpson. And we ran a bar there, and there's about eight or ten folk bands there on the day. And it's a very successful event, and we're very much hoping that it's going to be repeated next year, as this was the first one of its kind. Now, we also support the Family Day, again in Dysart Park, usually held in September. And we also hold regular beer tastings for the Grantham Business Club, which is usually held at the Belton Woods Hotel. Also, the Grantham Beer Festival we're big supporters of, and also the Arena UK Festival as well. And we are happy to run bars at, at these events. Alison, you work here. You help with the sales and marketing. So you support Gary on the sales side and Cathy on the marketing. That's right, yeah. And what am I looking at here? So this is the leaflet that we've created that goes out to all the pubs in our routes so that we can advertise all our beers. I use it as a reference because we do a variety of beers, all the way from the blondes and your uh, traditional looking ones to the darks and the stouts. And, and I can't always remember what's in every single beer, although I have tasted a lot of them. I can't remember all the different descriptors. So these give us a description of what all the different beers are so that when we speak to the pubs, we can give them a good idea of the kind of thing that they're going to be selling. This one's caught my eye. And some stout. What's that one described as? A rich, smooth and playfully delicious stout. Nuanced aromas, subtle complex flavours and dark seductive in appearance. This is uniquely Lincolnshire, beer to satisfy and savour. There's another local one here. Barkston Bitter. Uh, that's one that we've created because of the move that we've made to Barkston Heath and it commemorates the local area. We've described that as a distinctive yet easy drinking session beer that commemorates our new location at beautiful Barkston Heath in Lincolnshire. This ale is both vivid and mellow with the delicious waves of softly spiced citrus and ultra smooth malt base. A classic style beer at its modern day best. One more, what's this one here? Grantham Dark. Grantham Dark, that's actually a mild beer and it's 3.6% and it's described This is a wonderfully smooth, satisfying and traditional mild. Well hopped, gently fruity and a solid malt base. And that's one that we actually only have available at certain times of the year. So in April and May is generally when we produce it and, and we can say that it's definitely worth the wait. Do you need qualifications to be a brewer? You don't actually need qualifications to become a brewer. There is a brewing degree that you can take if you want to at, at the Heriot Watt University. And there are a large number of courses available for people who want to get into microbrewing. When I took over the brewery, I went on every single course I could find and just learnt all the science about it and uh, learnt just as much as I could and pick everybody's brains. And it's a lovely industry to be in. Everyone's very helpful and friendly and there's no backstabbing, so everyone's very convivial and willing to help where they can. We also want to keep furthering our knowledge and just to better ourselves where we can to create the quality and consistency of our beers and ensure that we do know what we're talking about kind of thing. So my husband Tim and I have just actually become beer sommeliers which involved a series of very rigorous exams and we were very very pleased to have passed because it was uh, yes quite quite stressful and quite difficult but yeah we're very thrilled now that we are beer sommeliers. I didn't know there was such a thing I thought it was just wine. 
That's right. It's quite a new qualification. I think it's only been out a couple of years. I think there are about 40 beer sommeliers now across the country. But we have the honour now of being the very first husband and wife beer sommelier team, which some are deeming a match made in heaven. Kathy, you were filming fairly recently, weren't you? That's right. I was filming as part of a national campaign called It's Better Down the Pub. It's Better Down the Pub is a national campaign launched by a bunch of like-minded organisations and companies representing Britain's 51,000 pubs across the UK, involving the drinkers of the beer, local brewers, landlords, and everybody really that was involved um, in the beer just uh, created a film called It's Better Down the Pub, tried to make people get back down the pub and to establish it as a really important heart of the community. There is a film of it. If you Google It's Better Down the Pub, that should bring up the film. And I'm actually in the film. I think I have about three lines in there, but it's a very inspiring campaign and we're very pleased to be a part of it. This month's heritage feature was about the pubs in Grantham and the brewing industry. Many thanks to all those involved. The local history feature is brought to you by Gravity FM in association with Your Heritage, awarding funds from the National Lottery. See www.hlf.org.uk.